It was midnight when my phone rang. I was still awake, reading the comments people were leaving on my latest blog post in what seemed like an unending stream. It was CNN on the phone letting me know that Anderson Cooper wanted to cover my latest story that I'd published just hours before. By morning, most of the major news stations had called. This was 2015. There had just been a major measles outbreak at Disneyland, resulting in 125 people contracting this dangerous disease. A pediatrician in my community wrote a letter explaining that his family had been exposed to the measles by an unvaccinated child. His three-year-old daughter had leukemia, and his 10-month-old son was too young to be vaccinated against the measles. If his immune-compromised daughter contracted the measles, there could be devastating, life-threatening consequences. I was so touched by his story and plea for parents to vaccinate their children that I published his letter on my pediatric health site, KidNurse, so that it could be shared beyond our community. Within 24 hours, my site had crashed three times due to the hundreds of thousands of readers from over 200 countries across the globe. My name is Danny Stringer. I'm also known as the Kid Nurse. This was a nickname born back in my college days due to its double meaning. At the time, I was a nurse learning to take care of kids by specializing in pediatrics. But really, I was a kid myself. I became a registered nurse at the age of 17, then I earned my master's degree and became a pediatric nurse practitioner by 18. This made me the youngest nurse practitioner in the world. So truly, that's how my story as the kid nurse began. I've had the honor of caring for thousands of children over the past six years. During my time in practice, I've discovered that parents desperately need access to quality pediatric information online. I decided to solve this by bringing the education I was giving every day in my exam room to the online world, and that's how the Kid Nurse blog was born. I started by tackling a topic that was very personal to me. The title of my first post was, My Journey, Leaving the Anti-Vaccination Movement. I admitted to the world that day that before becoming a pediatric nurse practitioner, I considered myself to be highly skeptical of vaccinations. Growing up, I'd heard all the most notorious accusations against vaccines, autism, mercury, government agendas, big pharma, you name it. I'll never forget the conversation I had with my mom when I told her my desired career choice. That's wonderful, she said, but you do realize you'll have to give vaccines, right? The drawback of administering vaccines nearly made me choose a different specialty, and reasonably so, as I didn't want to be responsible for giving something to children I didn't believe in. Conflicted as I was at the time, I decided to move forward with my nursing education and cross the vaccine bridge when I get, got there. Now, you may be thinking, doesn't everyone get vaccinated? Isn't it required? Understandably, many people are confused that some parents would be hesitant about arguably the greatest public health invention of our time. But over the past 20 years, vaccine hesitancy has been growing. Typically, vaccine-hesitant parents delay or refuse vaccines due to their concerns. For most pediatric providers, this is something we encounter on a daily basis. And frankly, many of my healthcare counterparts are very frustrated by this. Writing that first blog post was pivotal for me. Not only did I admit that I was once vaccine hesitant, but I had changed my mind. I'm the oldest of four children born to loving parents. When I was a baby, my mom vaccinated me due to her pediatrician's recommendation. Then she vaccinated my little sister. By the time my second sister was born, the voice of the vaccine hesitant movement was growing, and as a result, she received very few vaccinations. By the time my brother was born, he received almost none at all. Now, as I found myself pursuing my master's degree and coming up with topics for my thesis, I wanted to write about what I had heard from the vaccine hesitant community in which I had grown up. I was ready to study the adverse effects of vaccinations and all the children suffering from them. I wanted to represent those opinions to the scientific community I was now a part of. I confided my thoughts to one kind professor who simply told me that if I wanted to complete my thesis on that topic, I better start researching. Her words were void of ridicule and judgment. She just told me to do the work, so I did. And that's when I started to change my mind. I couldn't find enough substantiated, peer-reviewed evidence to indicate that vaccines were harming children. But I was learning a lot about the power that vaccines have to save lives. 
This was further validated once I was personally responsible for caring for children with preventable infectious disease. I studied a child whose arms and legs had been amputated after meningitis nearly cost him his life. I monitored a five-week-old in the hospital with pertussis, desperately hoping that she would get better. I admitted a toddler to the ICU with such severe dehydration from rotavirus that his pale, limp body was nearly lifeless before being revived. And I saw the devastation in his mother's eyes when she realized a vaccine she had turned down would have prevented his illness. I even met a distant relative who had been paralyzed most of his life on account of polio. No longer weary of giving vaccines, I pursued the field of pediatrics without pause. It would be several years before I returned to the idea of writing about vaccines publicly with that first post on kid nurse, and I was met with comments like these. It would be fair to say that I had experienced the full force of the vitriolic online vaccine debate. I had one and a half million readers come to Kid Nurse that first year, and I was so disheartened by the amount of hate and anger. But as you can see, the hate and anger didn't just come from people that were against vaccines. The animosity is definitely two-sided. I encountered some who were very dogmatic in their activism for vaccinations. They came across in some of their comments as though they are carrying the banner of vaccine science with an almost righteous fervor. Perhaps the issue with this group was not the principles of vaccine science, but the delivery of their message. Dogmatism is the tendency to lay down principles as incontrovertibly true without consideration of evidence or the opinions of others. But here's the problem. Good science is not dogmatic. The reason we love science is because it's ever-evolving, morphing into more and more discoveries of the world around us. I am thankful that these advances include vaccines. We still have terrible infectious diseases plaguing our planet. I believe wholeheartedly that science will unlock more vaccine cures for a dying and broken world. The same power that eradicated smallpox, controlled the ravage of polio, measles, diphtheria, and so many others will allow us to tackling malaria, HIV, possibly even Alzheimer's. Can you even imagine how that could change the world? But with this overwhelming power that science holds, we have to also acknowledge that it can unlock flaws. No biological agent will ever be perfect. Immunizations are not an exception to this. Because of that history and our inability to ever achieve perfection, we cannot become arrogant with our vaccination beliefs. The vaccine debate in America is undeniably broken. What I've learned is that the science speaks for itself, but kindness speaks even louder. What if we could depolarize the discussion so that the very parents that need to learn the most about vaccinations weren't scared away? What if we believed that the way we communicate about vaccines is equally important as the information we deliver? Vaccinating your children just because your pediatric provider tells you to is not necessarily the modem of operandi anymore. We have to acknowledge that many people in this current generation of parents are fearful of vaccines. It's time to change the conversation. What if this was not about being pro-vaccine versus anti-vaccine? How do you truly even define those groups? Pushing people into one category or the other is not accurately identifying parents' viewpoints. In many cases, I believe these categorizations go beyond mislabeling to become a villainization of well-intended parents. In practice, I find that parents generally fall into three categories. Vaccine advocates are parents who believe in vaccines strongly enough that they advise family and friends to vaccinate as well. Vaccine compliant parents vaccinate due to school or state requirements or the professional or personal recommendation of others, but they may still have unvoiced or unanswered questions about vaccines. And vaccine hesitant parents delay or refuse vaccines until their concerns are resolved. What if we could stop reducing the vaccine debate 
to an all or nothing conversation. Parents can fall into different categories of vaccine acceptance regarding different immunizations. Just because we hear a mother who has a concern about one vaccine doesn't mean that she has a concern about all of them. When we hear concerns from parents, we have to resist automatically assuming that they're resistant to all vaccines. And just because a parent is fearful or confused about vaccines doesn't make them a bad person or a bad parent. I was not a bad person when I was vaccine hesitant. My parents were not bad parents when they were vaccine hesitant. Parents should individually assess and ask questions about all vaccines as they seek to protect their children. Healthcare providers need to support them with information and support and compassion as they do this. As I've personally learned, sometimes change takes time. The vaccine debate always boils down to this question. What is the risk and what is the benefit? I really started to change my mind about vaccines when I looked at the ratio of risk to benefit. This is the real numbers behind what so often gets lost in the yelling and insults. First, I had to learn that the true risk of giving vaccines is so small, it's almost incalculable. What if we could teach parents that they risk far more by putting their children in the car and driving them to their pediatric office than actually giving them immunizations when they got there? Parents should also know that their children are 100 times more likely to be struck by lightning than to have a serious vaccine reaction. The immunization schedule does not overload the immune system. We now protect against twice as many diseases as we did in the 1980s, with a 97% less load on the immune system due to the decreased antigen count in today's vaccines. And finally, everyone needs to know that vaccines do not cause autism. In the thousands of vaccines I have given to children, I have never seen a serious adverse reaction. And then we have the benefits. They are very calculable. Vaccines save the lives of six million children across the world every year. But what does that really mean to us, especially here in America, when most of us have never seen such diseases before? That death toll will always be a faraway number until we understand the unspeakable importance of one. One infant with pertussis struggling to breathe. The sound of those gasps for air, once experienced, can never be unheard. One child forever disabled. One child with cancer whose health is left to the mercy of those who hold the power to vaccinate. One look into the eyes of grieving parents. Parents who would do anything to go back and make a different decision now that they know a vaccine could have avoided so much pain and suffering. You don't understand vaccines until you understand the people they save. I know because I've seen it. I've walked through these devastating situations with real patients and real families. Every one of those situations changed my world. For example, these are some of the children of friends who have been personally impacted by preventable infectious diseases. This sweet little boy contracted the measles after a family trip to Disneyland. He was only four months old at the time. This brave, brave boy has spent over half of his life fighting cancer. Deciding not to vaccinate directly impacts herd immunity, which directly impacts him. And this beautiful, beautiful baby contracted pertussis, also known as whooping cough. This is one of the last pictures his mother took with him before he passed away. The plausible risk of damaging lives through vaccinations is so small. Next to the comparison of saving the lives of millions of children, there is no comparison. You know what I pray for each of the parents I work with? I pray that they never ever see the day that they have to bury a child. That they never experience the permanent paralyzing grief of death. You know who also prayed the same prayer? Every generation of parents preceding us who came face to face with deadly infectious disease. Vaccines are the very solution that they fought and prayed so hard for. I've decided that I'm not going to be so tricked into fearing the solution that I forget the enemy that infectious disease is to our children. I'm a healer. I've spent half of my life studying and working to fix children and their families. It's a gift, but it comes at a cost. 
In its essence, my job is to fix childhood death and disease. That's devastating because children aren't supposed to die. They're not supposed to face crippling illness and families are not supposed to face the despair of this reality, but they still do. Practicing pediatric medicine means that we will do anything and everything we can to fight death and disease in the lives of the children we serve. We stand in the gap. We believe for the best. We accept the crying, broken, exhausted parents and tell them that they are stronger than they know. We reject guilt. We empower parents to be the leaders that their children need. We are the resounding voice that says it's going to be okay. And as Henry Beecher said, we believe that children are the hands by which we take hold of heaven. Whether it's stewarding that piece of heaven that they bring to us or rarely ushering it back. We love children. We don't do pediatrics because it's a job. We do it because we love it. Ultimately, I changed my mind about vaccines because I discovered they're one of the strongest tools I have to accomplish my mission. I believe in vaccines because I can tell you the cost of losing our children to preventable infectious disease is incalculable. Sure, we have the numbers. History tells us that vaccines have saved millions. But honestly, what I've learned in practice has taught me that saving the life of one child is enough. Thank you.